All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Sarah Anderson, and I'm the Director of Field Services at the Oregon Office of Rural Health. I'm joined here today by our speakers, who I will introduce in just a moment, as well as the Office of Rural Health's Rural Population Health Program Manager, Stefa Dragoon. Um, and this is the third in our six part series of on population health. And again, we really appreciate you being here today. Today's webinar is community health workers approaches to health equity and payment strategies presented by Iris Bixler of Pacific source and King of OHSU and summer Prentel uh, noodleman of EOCCO. This webinar series is designed to establish a common understanding of population health and where we can go from here. Community health workers offer a dynamic solution to addressing population health needs within our rural communities, from working with the Latinx population to serving veterans, the aging population, and much, much more. Uh, population health and health equity have grown in focus over the years for many reasons, including, including the realization that the high level of healthcare spending in the US is not producing the value we'd like to see in terms of overall impact on health. Uh, the healthcare industry is undergoing profound change in financing and service delivery as it shifts from a financial system that uh, makes payments based on value to one, excuse me, volume to one that is based on value. Um, and today, rural healthcare organizations face the challenge of remaining viable under current payment systems while preparing for new value-based payment systems that are already being adopted in various forms across the country. This series is intended to learn together and to have some of the conversations about how to approach population health moving forward. Next slide. Here's the list of the remaining webinars in this series, which you can register for on our website. I'll put the link in the chat in a moment. The date for the July webinar is still pending, um, but we'll have the information posted on our website shortly. And in addition, the recordings and slides from our previous population health webinars in this series, as well as this one, um, are available on the webpage, which I will put uh, in the chat in just a moment after I'm done with introductions. Next slide. I also wanted to let you know that the ORH Population Health Grant Program will be opening very soon. The grant supports critical access hospitals and provider-based rural health clinics with addressing a specific population health need in their community. You can see this year's round of fund funded projects on our website, and uh, the request for proposals for this coming year will be released on June 1st, so coming up very quickly. Um, and I will put the link for that in the chat in a moment as well. Next slide. Um, the, uh, these webinars are eligible for CEUs, um, and I'm going to put that chat, or excuse me, the uh, survey for that in the chat in just a moment as well. Um, and with that, I am pleased to introduce our speakers briefly. Uh, Iris Bixler received her BA in Women's Studies from the University of Oregon and is an OHA certified community health worker, peer support specialist, and birth doula. She's been a traditional, the senior traditional health worker liaison for Pacific Source Community Solutions and is the current policy chair on the board of directors for the Oregon Doula Association. Ann King has spent the last 20 years focused on understanding and advancing health equity for rural and low income populations through research, policy, advocacy, and grant making. She serves as the associate director for the Oregon Rural Practice Based, uh, excuse me, Practice Based Research Network, where she directs a team that provides education and technical assistance for coordinated care organizations, clinics, and their communities and teaches in the Masters of Science and Healthcare program at OHSU. And uh, last but not least, we have Summer Prentel Noodleman, who has worked in the healthcare space for 15 years and has been with EOCO since its inception in uh, 2012. Over the past 10 years with EOCCO, she's worked to engage the delivery system to shape and evolve EOCC policies, has overseen and ensured operational successes and efficiencies, and 
most recently in her current role as Director of Medicaid Programs. She focuses on CCO 2.0 priorities and deliverables, quality initiatives, and metrics performance. The EOCCO THW Liaison and Health Equity Administrator are on Summer's team and together look to improve the delivery of Medicaid benefits to recipients in Eastern Oregon. Welcome, Iris, Anne, and Summer. Thanks so much for being here to share your expertise. And I am going to turn it over to Anne, who will start for us. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah, for inviting me to be here today. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to spend a little time talking about what a community health worker is, just to kind of um, uh, set the stage for the discussion. Um, and then we'll spend some time on um, what they do and then payment strategies for their work. So um, this is the American Public Health Association definition of um, community health workers. They're frontline public health um, uh, workers who are trusted members of and have an unusually and or have an unusually close understanding of the community served. Um, the trusting relationship that they have enables the worker to serve as a liaison link or intermediary between the health or social services needed by the patient and the community um, to facilitate access to those services and improve quality and cultural competence of service delivery. Uh, and they also build uh, individual and community capacity by increasing health knowledge and self-sufficiency through a range of activities such as outreach, Community education, informal counseling, social support, and advocacy. So it's a pretty commonly held definition of a community health worker work. Um, next, please. I'm going to talk briefly about health equity um, framework. So health equity scholars use a metaphor of a stream of causation to illustrate how social and institutional inequities lead to increased risk of disease and injury. Um, and ultimately to higher rates of mortality and mor uh, morbidity and mortality. So in this health equity framework, which is um, from the Bay Area Regional Health and Equities Initiative, you'll see social and institutional inequities based on race, ethnicity, class, immigration status, gender and sexual orientation give rise to policies um, and racism that lead to unequal social determinants of health for certain populations. Um, and community health workers are often employed to address the, these structural inequities um, that are depicted in this framework. Next slide, please. So just as an example um, for uh, community health workers working on diabetes, um, so CHWs um, address populations that are at risk of diabetes. They're often deployed within clinical settings, um, and they work to provide culturally responsive preventive medicine counseling or risk factor reduction interventions around um, diabetes prevention and disease management. Diabetes is experienced disproportionately by minority populations. Um, for example, about 18% of black adults and 17% of Hispanic adults have a diabetes diagnosis, and that's compared to 10% of white adults. Um, and we also know that minorities access health services at, a lo at lower levels than whites. So this disparity is probably larger due to lack of access to care. Um, if you follow the health equity framework and this diabetes example, you see that racism demonstrated through um, policies like redlining, segregation, and discrimination affects the food environment. So the number type, affordability, and accessibility of food. Um, and this limits the access to fresh and healthy food for populations who live in these areas. And this ultimately affects the diet of those populations. So um, an increased incidence of prediabetes, type 2 diabetes is seen as a result, as is increased um, morbid morbidity and mortality from diabetes for those populations that have experienced um, these inequities. And where CHWs really play a part is in, um, you know, across the health equity continuum, understanding the needs of the populations, what's led to the disparities, um, advocating for those populations in healthcare and in social service settings, um, and helping to educate and connect the patients to services and resources they need. Um, 
for diabetes, this could include facilitating access to culturally and linguistically accessible um, diabetes prevention information, um, to healthy food and culturally accessible food, um, to healthcare services and to social service supports. Um, and CHWs not only work to reduce inequities for populations and in individuals, um, but they also reduce overall healthcare costs. And so for the diabetes example, um, the research has shown that their interventions have been found to reduce overall healthcare costs by 10% for those populations that they work with um, who have diabetes. So a really big impact of, um, of trying to address some of these um, population-based social inequities uh, to reduce um, morbidity, mortality, and overall healthcare costs. Next slide, please. So what are the strategies to pay for CHWs? I think it's, um, it's fair to say that uh, we're at a, maybe a crossroads in Oregon thinking about, you know, how do we um, both pay for services and provide some sort of sustainability for CHWs and for the organizations that employ them. Um, one of the ways that that's done is through direct employment. So sometimes you'll see um, plans or health centers, um, community organizations will directly employ the CHWs. Um, others, other methods are things like grants, value-based payment arrangements, which I'll talk about a bit, um, and then fee for service, typical claims, um, or in lieu of services, which is available through state Medicaid. Um, and then there's hybrid and multi sector approaches, really all sorts of approaches to this work. Uh, next, please. Thinking about grants, um, they're generally tied to completing circuit certain activities and they are time bound. So grants are often used to start new CHW programs to fund things like infrastructure and staffing. Um, the downside of grants is the effort required to obtain them and that the grant giving organizations generally want to support new ideas and not be relied upon for long term sustainability. So um, I've seen grants for CHW organizations. Um, Come from foundations, federal and state agency grants and contracts, um, hospital and health system community benefit programs, uh, and payer community benefit programs, et cetera. So lots and lots of ways that grants have um, provided uh, support for CHWs. Um, next, please. So this is a packed slide. I'm going to go through a few of the columns, but. Um, Value based payment arrangements are something that um, I think you're going to hear more about from our um, from the next speakers, but they're really where reimbursement is tied to, to some aspect of quality rather than just quantity of care. Um, and this is a nice framework um, from the healthcare payment learning and action network. I have provided a link here for you. Um, but value based payment arrangements are a growing method of paying for CHWs. And a key feature of these arrangements is that reimbursement is generally tied to quality rather than quantity. Um, if you look at the pink column, which is category two, uh, fee for service with a link to quality and value, um, you'll see that the payment arrangements are um, provide foundational payments for things like infrastructure and operations. Um, things like care coordination fees or investments in health IT. Um, and they, they may pay for reporting. Um, there can be bonuses for reporting data, or they may be paying for quality, such as getting patients to attend appointments or prevent uh, or obtain preventive care services. So that's kind of one category of value based payment arrangements. Another category in the purple column is um, alternative payment arrangements built on fee for service architecture. So these um, will include something things like shared savings where um, the the funder pays um, or excuse me shares back with the CH organizations funds saved due to their activities. So um, you know maybe that they're working towards um, uh, some sort of activity that uh, is believed to lower healthcare costs and 
if there is a savings from that cost, there may be upside risk in the contract where the CHW organization gets a portion of that savings. There could also be upside and downside risk, meaning the organization, CHW organization gets a portion of the savings or they might get a reduction in their payment if savings do not occur. Um, and then we'll look at the green category um, for payment arrangements. These are based on populations. So sometimes we'll see um, payments based on conditions. Uh, hang on. Payments based on conditions like um, managing diabetes or um, maybe managing patients who have been recently discharged from the emergency department. And um, sometimes those patient payments will include global budgets for population based care, um, which the CHW would need to stay organization would need to stay into it, uh, excuse me, stay within so as not to lose money. So um, there's lots of other types of value based. Payment arrangements um, and kind of mixtures of all of these, but uh, there's a couple of links in the slide if you want to go explore some of um, some of this work. Next, please. Fee for service payments. So these are basically paying a provider for a specific service. In Oregon, um, CHWs can provide services to Medicaid members on a fee for service basis by following guidance from the health authority. Um, this guidance includes that they have to be certified um, by the state, registered with the traditional health care work, health worker registry. They need to have a national provider identifier, NPI, and be enrolled as an Oregon Medicaid provider. Um, and then they can perform services within their scope of practice under the supervision of a licensed provider. Um, often some of this work that that to have CHWs registered, get their NPI, kind of the um, this administrative setup is is supported by the organizations that are employing the CHWs or supporting their work um, to try to help reduce some of those some of those um, uh, hurdles to doing fee for service payments. Um, next, please. In non-traditional settings, um, like non-healthcare community agencies, CHWs can provide similar services through fee-for-service me method um, through what's called in lieu of services, which are, um, these are covered services that are linked, um, but provided, linked to the what's um, typically covered, but it's provided in an alternative setting. So. An example is um, a CHW providing a health promotion or disease prevention activities with a homeless member or patient in a homeless camp would be a would be a um, a type of ILOS. This is an emerging payment methodology, um, and it's something that there's a, quite a lot of information on the web that um, we've helped to develop. I put a link into the slide deck if you want to explore it more. Um, next, please. So then, of course, there's hybrid and multi-sector approaches. Sometimes you'll see grants for startup, and then um, there are value-based arrangements or fee-for-service arrangements layered on top. There's also multi-sector approaches where the government grants are layered under value-based payment arrangements from the payer or the health system. Um, you know, ultimately, the goal of these arrangements is to maximize value for the population that's being served and to provide some sort of stable funding to support CHWs and their organizations so that they can really focus on delivering the services and not so much on writing grants or you know, doing administrative um, activities. So next, please. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Summer Pranel Noodleman, who's the Director of Medicaid Programs for the Eastern Oregon CCO. Thanks, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about EOCCO's experience um, as it relates to THW reimbursement. So uh, next slide, please. And then one more. All right. So I'm going to start today talking about EOCCO's history of CHWs. So back in 2015, uh, EOCCO really saw the benefit of community health workers and how they could expand the uh, workforce 
in our rural and frontier service area. And based on this, EOCCO created a partnership with Oregon State University and started to create a certification course, which I will go over in a future slide. So 2016, that was a big year for EOCCO in the CHW space. We developed and implemented a reimbursement model, introducing three codes for reimbursement. Uh, contracts were written to include these three um, initial CHW codes. We also launched the OSU CHW training program and then provided, uh, began providing grants to our delivery system and com community-based organizations. Next in 2017, EOCCO participated in a CHW ECHO program uh, specific to the EOCCO service area and uh, EOCCO presented a module on billing. In 2018, was another big year for us as OHA adopted the three billing codes that EOCCO implemented in 2016 and added them to the fee schedule. Uh, this was a huge accomplishment for EOCCO and the investment over the past couple years. All right, so next slide. For those of you who may not be familiar with our CHW um, investment and current partnership with OSU, I wanted to provide just a little bit of background. So we began a partnership with Oregon State University's Center for Health Innovation in 2015 and developed an entry-level community health worker training program. Um, this course was developed by the OSU team and EOCCO and, the, and then later approved by OHA. So OA, um, sorry, OSU trained 115 CHWs in the first three years of the program from 2016 to 2019 with a majority of those within the EOCCO service area. Um, in 2019, the program started to take off and we saw an uptick in enrollment for cohorts. Um, the largest cohort size um, in spring 2017 was 19 participants. However, in spring 2021, um, the new record cohort size was 29 participants. Um, and since the inception of the training program, we've uh, had a total of 352 CHWs that have gone through the program. And there are 27 students um, in the current cohort as we speak. And the upcoming summer cohort is already full and the fall um, one is filling up very quickly. So when the partnership between EOCCO and OSU was formed, EOCCO did pledge to contribute $150,000 annually for the uh, first three years, um, which we extended through 2021 based on the success of the program. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is a little bit more about the OSU CHW training program, which again is OHA certified. Uh, the program prepares individuals to work as an entry level CHW, um, increases the availability of high quality tra uh, training for CHWs, it increases value and pay for performance. It also focuses on social determinants of health and health equity and helps maintain sustainable cost, cost growth. Um, the program uses a blended model of 22.5 hours of in-person large group format, four hours of live virtual sessions and 58.5 hours of online training. And really this format um, increases accessibility of the training program to people across the state of Oregon who live far from traditional training sites up and down the I-5 corridor. So, um, oh, and throughout the pandemic, the program shifted to be fully remote. So based on the investment that EOCCO has made, there's a reduced cost of $800 for students within the EOCCO region and $1,200 for uh, students outside the region. So once certified, a CHW needs to renew every three years by submitting a renewal application along with 20 continuous education units. Um, OSU does offer three uh, continue, continued education modules on management of chronic health conditions, poverty and related social determinants of health, as well as mental and behavioral health. Um, OSU has also developed a leading, uh, leadership certificate course to provide a professional development opportunity for CHWs who wish to grow their capacity for leadership. All right, so now that we've had some background, let's move on to billing. Next slide, please. All right, so 
Once a C, uh, CHW goes through training and becomes an OHA certified CHW, billing can start. Now I will say <laughs> that there is much more involved than just saying billing will start. So once someone is ready to bill, here's the process for standard billing to EOCCO. Um, this is an example of a CHW that works part of the member's care team, but is unable to bill directly to a CCO or OHA. So a LHCP, which is short for a licensed healthcare professional, they order educational services for a member by a CHW. Then the CHW performs and documents the services provided. From there, the uh, licensed healthcare professional bills the services performed by the CHW to EOCCO. Now, the key element um, here is that the licensed healthcare professional bills a claim under their name, not the CHW. EOCCO will, pro EOCCO will process the claim and reimburses the uh, licensed healthcare professional, and then the licensed healthcare professional pays the CHWs for performed services. So in the beginning, um, this was required since CHWs could not enroll as a provider with DMAP and uh, attain a, a DMAP number to be able to bill. Um, this is an example of a situation, we still have them, where a CHW might work at a clinic, a health department, part of a health system, um, or a community-based organization, and is employed within that organization. And so that's how funding for somebody that's not registered could happen. All right, next slide, please. So the funding sources that EOCCO provides um, includes the OHA fee-for-service billing, as we outlined in the previous claims example. Um, this, is, uh, this also includes CHWs that enroll as a DMAP provider. We reimburse both contracted and non-contracted providers. Uh, Non-contracted providers are reimbursed on the current fee schedule, whereas contracted providers are reimbursed at their contracted rates, which is usually slightly higher than the DMAP fee schedule. Next, like Anne talked about, is there's direct employment. We currently uh, employ two CHWs, and we have a open CHW liaison position. However, our current health equity administrator is our acting um, interim CHW liaison. Uh, next, we have medical home payments, uh, where a clinic can achieve a tier level um, based on their clinic's ability to achieve the AAA, better health, better care, lower cost for Oregonians. Um, the medical home payments are intended to be an investment in quality initiatives, including community health workers, to achieve that triple aim. So for EOCCO, a, a five-star certified clinic, um, the additional payments uh, payment is $24.50 per member per month that's assigned to that clinic. Also, um, EOCCO does have a shared savings model. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me. And as EOCCO aligns with Oregon's priority for lower health care costs while increasing health outcomes, um, EOCCO, really, uh, EOCCO has a longstanding shared savings model that focuses on those two components. And the shared savings model provides a portion of a, a cost savings to providers who help control spend while increasing quality, including CHW investments. Um, and these are some of the examples that uh, Anne showed on the grid, the colorful grid uh, for value-based payment. All right, next we have community benefit initiative reinvestments, and man, that's a mouthful. So we call it our EOCCO CBIR program. And these are EOCCO funded grants that supports EOCCO members and yet go beyond, as these can be awarded at the community level with the intent to focus on EOCCO members, but they can, can uh, excuse me, but they can uh, serve a community. The focus of these initiatives are products that are transformational, a new idea, technology, public health, health focused, or metric centric. Um, in the past two years, we've had a specific THW bucket of funding available as well. Um, some examples of grants um, that have been funded by EOCCO. Uh, last year, we had a pharmacy um, in one of our frontier counties receive a grant where a CHW would assist in medication adherence and social determinants of health navigation. Uh, we also provided a grant for a bilingual CHW and a bilingual peer 
um, at a community thrift store to meet people where they're at and provide navigation services um, as it relates to social determinants of health. Lastly, a grant for the placement of a CHW in a local school district to address social determinants of health as well as health care needs of students and families. Um, additionally, we also have a scholarship program through these funds that individuals that live and work in the EOCCO service area can apply for a scholarship for CHW training. The last um, bullet I have is uh, community reinvestments. So these are funds either through a bonus payment or grant that support quality work, including THW investments. Um, EOCCO is unique as we have 12 counties Thus, we've decided to keep decision making at the local level and establish 12 community partnerships that have representation um, sent to the larger EOCCO Community Advisory Council. Uh, funding each year is around 750,000 to the local community health partnerships to implement projects that align with their community health improvement plans. Um, and as many of you know, if you've been to one Oregon County, you've been to one Oregon County. So this really allows the local communities to fund projects to impact the uniquely individual communities. Total reinvestments through 2022 for, for these areas is 219.9 million. Um, and you know, you might be saying that that's nice and all, but how can you fund a, a CHW with just encounter billing? Let's take a look. Next slide, please. All right, so here's an example of a CHW that is reimbursed at the current DMAP fee schedule rate. So if like a CHW had an encounter today, this would be the current rate if it was paid at um, the fee-for-service uh, fee rates. Um, EOCCO also knows that CHWs have other tasks as we know these positions could be multifunctional. So this example accounts for that. So let's say you employ a full-time CHW um, the CHW works 40 hours a week um, and is in face to face uh, in a face to face billing setting with an EOCCO member for half the time. So 20 hours a week. Um, that would be 40 units of 98960. And remember that a unit is 30 minutes. That's why it's doubled and there's 40 units. Um, 98960 is usually based on contract terms. However, again, fee for service rates right now is $21.44. 40 encounters um, a week would result in $643 um, in weekly revenue. And since there's 52 years in a, or, sorry, 52 weeks in a year, that would be approximately $33,436 per year. Now, that amount doesn't include any of the expanding billing codes that OHA published on the fee schedule in 2020, or for the fluctuation in billing for group sessions, such as diabetes group training. Uh, please keep in mind that this is uh, from, only from an EOCCO funding stream perspective. So in essence, the CHW could be utilized by private insurance, Medicare, uh, commercial, where EOCCO is not the only funding source, and that also includes grants and other funding that could be used to compensate for the other half of the CHW's time. All right, so you might be saying, hey, Summer, this looks fine and all, but this is all fluffy stuff. Grants, billing, training, enrolling, expanded code sets. Getting started is really hard. So how does a CHW serving EOCCO, EOCCO members get started? It's totally confusing. So let's go over some resources. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so EOCCO understands the challenges in getting started. Um, so we have taken an approach to provide one-on-one -on -one and group technical assistance. The technical assistance really starts with having clear published documents. So on the right hand of the slide is the start of our CHW DMAP enrollment and reimbursement structure. This walks through how to become a certified CHW and then goes through how to become a DMAP registered provider including all of the links of where to go. From there, we really provide a concierge approach to helping the THW become certified and start to bill. This includes supporting, um, this includes support with submitting a DMAP registration because that's not easy to do. Uh, filling out a CMS 1500 um, because there are people that have never done that and they don't have the support of a billing team. 
We talk, we can help with documentation requirements, one-on-one -on -one meetings with our THW liaison or our billing staff or somebody with contracting so they can understand the contract requirements, which can be really overwhelming to many. This also includes support after the billing process starts, and that's really key. It's discouraging to go through all of this work to finally bill a claim and then have it denied. And usually it's with a very simple adjustment that can be fixed and rebuilt. So we are happy to help along the way and help navigate this confusing process with our CHWs. We also have an overarching CHW and doula policies and all of these can uh, be found on our website. So um, on our website, you will find all of these documents plus a recorded training session on CHW billing, um, including all the training slides. It's a great um, reference but does not replace that one-on-one -on -one technical assistance that we provide for THW specific situations since they're all so different. So uh, next slide, please. So the next three slides, I, I know I'm short on time, so I'm gonna uh, just summarize these really quickly. These go over, how is this all panning out? So some highlights um, on the next slide, um, or on this slide, sorry, about community health workers is that, um, We've had an increase of growth of CHWs in our service area. We do have CHWs reported as OHA certified qualified interpreters as well, which is also a re, uh, reimbursable service. Um, and encounter claims are up by 100%. And in 2022, we had about 22,000 encounters of a CHW with a member. Next slide, please. Um, doula utilization, we struggled in this space, but um, we've we've done a lot of work to have some doulas. So we have six uh, doulas and actually that one currently certifying um, has been certified. Um, and we have no billing encounters as of mid last year, but that has since changed. Um, also with the support of raising the reimbursement rates for doula services as of July 2022. Uh, next slide. And our peer services, um, we have 69 total peers in our service area, 24 report living with a disability, and 23 peers report as Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. Um, and there's really been a reduction we've seen in the claims um, and encounter data, and it's, I really feel, due to the um, workforce shortages within the behavioral health space. So next slide, please. Um, and here are some additional resources, both from EOCCO and OHA with links. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. So thank you for having me today. And I apologize for going over time, um, but I will now hand it over to Iris Bickler with Pacific Source. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Summer, uh, all of those things make my heart happy. So uh, thank you for, for all that EOCCO is doing uh, with traditional health workers. So. As mentioned, my name is Iris Bixler. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Senior Traditional Health Worker Liaison with Pacific Source and happy to talk to you today about our community health worker payment models. Next slide. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about community health worker history. I think it's important we root these conversations in the history uh, of the work. Um, review again, I know others have done this, but just talk a bit about training and certification, including some barriers to both. Um, I'll go through some fee-for-service, VBP, and community-based contracts uh, that Pacific Source is piloting, uh, and then talk just briefly about some other funding opportunities. Next slide. Um, I think it's important, too, to really um, uh, share with you about me. So traditional health workers are relational, um, and so I just wanted to share a bit about my work uh, there's a picture of me with my family. Uh, as mentioned before, I am a community health worker, peer support, uh, and was a practicing birth and postpartum doula for more than 20 years. Um, so I feel like I come to this work naturally. I'm a native Oregonian and I'm really committed to uh, making sure our communities have access to care. Next slide. So as you may know, a decade ago, uh, the Oregon legislature created this uh, traditional health worker term that encompasses several different worker types and community health workers are one of them. So community health workers have served in their own communities all over the world for centuries. In Central America, Mexico, they call them promotores. 
uh, a lot of community health worker services in Africa, specifically in South Africa, supporting folks with HIV. Um, so really, when we think about this work, we think about it as historically grassroots. Um, it's healthcare uh, in a way that's culturally specific um, from people who are part of that culture, given in, in their community in the way that they think their community um, really needs it and can absorb it. So one of the things I think about when I, when I think about the history of community health workers is that because Oregon passed this legislation that allowed community health workers to bill Medicaid, what we're talking about is a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. So as we, as we think about best practice for integrating these types of providers into all kinds of settings, whether it's clinical, community-based, schools, street outreach, whatever it is, um, again, just thinking about um, the why and the how of this work and how it was developed, I think um, will help us all kind of move forward into the future to make sure that these roles are um, efficacious and, and really rooted in, um, in the true practice of community. Next slide. So as mentioned, uh, to be able to that uh, the, the application itself has only been in English up until recently. Uh, it is now in Spanish. Uh, there are sometimes some challenges for folks to get through the background check process. So just be cognizant as you're working in these spaces um, that there is a background check requirement and, uh, and to reach out with questions as, as, uh, as those come up for you. I'll also say that trainings can be hard to find uh, I know that there was a recent community health worker training. Uh, they, they were filled in less than an hour once their registration opened. Um, it, is a, it is a hot commodity right now, uh, and folks are, are really um, wanting to engage in these trainings. And um, I think we as a, as a group of Oregonians need to think about capacitating more opportunities for trainings. They also come uh, with expenses. So uh, most trainings are fifteen to twenty five hundred dollars um, for a lot of folks. That's that's not accessible. Um, so so again, as EEO CCO is doing and others, Pacific Source is offering scholarships. So we partner with trainings in all of our CCO regions. Uh, so Pacific Source is in four CCO regions: Lane County, uh, with Eugene Springfield as as our metro in that in that uh, region; Marion Polk, which is uh, um, has Salem as kind of the, the metro hub there. We're in Central Oregon uh, with Ben Redmond Sisters. We're up in the gorge with Hood River and, and up in that river area. Uh, and then we have a partnership with HealthShare uh, for some memberships up in Portland as well. So again, partnering with train, trainers in each of those regions to make sure that folks who are interested in doing this work have access to scholarships. So happy to uh, happy to be doing that. Next slide. So talking about the fee schedule, um, as Summer mentioned, uh, the OHA has released some community health worker codes. In, in 2020, the OHA released a, a billing guide that had, I think about 19 codes and wanted to um, talk a little bit about the history of how those codes came into being. Uh, so, through the Traditional Health Worker Commission, there was a sub uh, a subcommittee called the Payment Models Subcommittee, which myself and another woman named Angie Kuzma was, uh, were, was chairing. And so that committee actually looked at thousands of codes uh, and, and said to ourselves, do those codes um, fit into some kind of scope of practice for a community health worker? Is the license uh, or certification requirement for that code, does that also fit into the community health worker uh, OARs? And so there was this kind of uh, elimination process for finding these codes that eventually um, became approved to be able to be used. And I mentioned that again, because square peg, round hole. Uh, many traditional health workers, uh, doulas and peers, have codes that are very specific to them and their work. 
But community health workers, it was again, a process of elimination. So some of these codes feel a little bit off um, and or it, the, the totality of the codes don't actually encompass the full scope of the community health worker work. So we know that community health workers should be out in their community, providing outreach and education, working in groups, presenting at, at, at commission meetings and all kinds of places, uh, in addition to the one-on-one -on -one support that they're offering um, their, their community members. But those codes really um, don't, don't allow for Medicaid billing in all of those places and spaces that community health workers should be working. The other limitation and, and barrier that I see is that there are supervision requirements as have been outlined by others today, um, but really thinking about community health worker fee-for-service billing requiring that a clinician uh, have an assessment of a member, create a care plan for that member that that community health worker is billing under really prevents some community-based organizations without clinical supervision uh, being able to bill fee-for-service. So while these codes have been a great start uh, to the work of reimbursing community health worker uh, services uh, in the Medicaid space, um, we see it as just a slice of the possibility. Next slide. So one of the ways that Pacific Source supports our community health workers uh, is through paying a per member per month uh, and also allowing the additional uh, fee-for-service billing if it applies for our tier three patient-centered primary care homes or PCPCHs. So as we work with primary care in integrating community health workers uh, into their care teams, our traditional health worker liaisons support with best practice education. So we'll work with the office manager, the community health worker themselves, the providers in the group to really think about workflows, uh, to think about what it is to have a, a community health worker within the walls of a clinic and potentially what it looks like for that community health worker to be working outside the clinic, supporting members in their home or taking a walk in the park. Um, so really the, the liaison role of supporting uh, those clinics in best practice integration, I think is, is critical to this work. Uh, there are some reporting quite requirements for our PCPCHs that have community health workers, kind of per the CCO 2.0 contract, um, but we hope those, those aren't too laborious. Next slide. So when we think about fee-for-service, we think about, about our value-based payment arrangements with our PCPCHs, um, we kind of asked ourselves, what's missing? Um, and it was really our connection to community-based organizations and our, and our funding from Medicaid to support services that we knew our members really wanted and already were accessing. So Pacific Source um, ended up creating a, a new payment model. Uh, we call it programmatic payment. Um, we, we worked with the traditional health worker liaisons and leadership within our organization in 2021 uh, to pilot these contracts in 2022 in both Marion Polk and Lane CCOs. So this is specifically for community health workers, as well as peer support specialists. And these specific contracts pay for um, both one-on-one -on -one services, uh, as well as group education and support. They also have a component around um, paying for a percentage of the um, program's overhead. We do require um, that community-based organizations have a contract with us for this work. And we do actually credential the traditional health workers through a process that Pacific Source has created called validation. It's a little bit of a, of a pared down version of, of a credentialing application specific for traditional health workers. What that allows uh, that organization to do um, by being uh, credentialed through our uh, organization and, and contracted with us is that they are able to get access to our InTouch for providers which lets them then check member benefits. So for example, a member walks into a peer drop-in center, they're able to bill us for that service because they are able to check that that member actually has Pacific Source as their CCO. Uh, they submit a monthly Excel uh, spreadsheet to us that we use um, to pay those services. Um, so it's not a traditional 1500 claims form 
Um, we really wanted to create a, a process that was as simple as possible, um, that really was designed for community-based organizations that didn't have electronic medical records or, um, or complicated uh, you know, computer systems, um, but really wanted to meet them where they were at within their organization's development um, so that they could, they could, we could partner with them uh, in a really trauma-informed way. And we're really excited about this work. So this year we have expanded into Central Oregon and the Gorge CCOs. Um, these services include things like, as I mentioned, drop-in centers. Uh, we're now uh, contracted with an affordable housing company, uh, that a uh, community-based organization that um, provides traditional health worker services within their housing um, so that families have access to those kinds of services. Uh, we work with traditional health workers that serve families with children with special needs. Um, we have traditional health workers through this payment methodology that are serving immigrants and refugees, uh, folks um, who are accessing services for addiction and mental health supports. Um, so really it encompasses a broad range of services within our community because we really understand that if someone is going to access care, sometimes those community-based organizations are actually the first point of contact. So we really wanted to capacitate them in, in doing that work. Next slide. I won't, I won't go over this too much. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to share these slides and you'll be able to click on the link for more information. There are other ways Pacific Source supports uh, our communities, uh, community health worker uh, training and, and capacity building. Uh, included. Um, I outlined them there, so you're welcome to, to click on those and, and reach out if you have any other information about some of these other opportunities. Next slide. Um, as Summer also mentioned, uh, we have lots of documents on our documents and forms section of our website that outlines all kinds of information about doulas, peers, other types of traditional health workers. So if you're interested in any more information, I encourage you to check that space out. Next slide. And then just wanted to highlight my colleagues. I am one of a team of four. Uh, we are regional uh, in nature. So uh, I work mostly in the Lane CCO. Uh, Nancy, Chad, and Sam are uh, in our other CCO regions. So I welcome you all to reach out to them if you have questions and you're in a specific uh, area of the state where uh, Pacific Source has a CCO and you want to reach out to your local liaison, uh, I encourage you to do that. And I think that's all for me. Back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Summer, Iris, and Anne, for a really wonderful presentation. Um, we've had a very active chat going on, and I have some questions um, from the chat, um, some of which have been answered, but I think they're important to highlight here. Um, before we do that, um, I would be really remiss in um, not pointing out that the Office of Rural Health, in um, collaboration with the Coalition of Local Health Officials, uh, have a three-year grant through HRSA, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, called Healthy Rural Oregon, where we are uh, working over the next three years to train uh, 127 community health workers across the state in rural areas um, and uh, a special program in Mulhear County to train community paramedics. Um, the focused counties include Wasco, Jefferson, Deschutes, Crook, Wheeler, Lane, Klamath, and Mulhear, but um, we did get guidance from HRSA that we can go beyond those counties as well. Um, I put a link uh, pretty far up in the chat for information about that program. Um, but in addition to training community health workers, we're cross training them as well um, based on their interests and the needs of the organizations. So folks are being cross trained as healthcare interpreters, um, uh, as medical assistants, and a number of different uh, positions. So now we'll get into questions. Um, and uh, if you have to leave before we uh, are getting through these questions, I'm going to put a survey in the chat, which we really hope that you'll take um, before you uh, close out today, uh, because it'll help us with future webinars. And there is also a, a continuing education credits available for this, um, for your participation in this webinar. Uh, but I will ask the question first, and Summer and Anne, if you could turn your cameras on too. 
um, and whomever wants to answer, just uh, go ahead and start talking. Uh, so, uh, what's the difference we, we were hearing throughout the presentation, uh, community health workers, and we also um, talked a little bit about traditional health workers. And the question is, what's the difference between uh, the two and understanding that community health workers are part of that larger umbrella of community health or of traditional health workers? Um, and then also uh, part two of the question is, are there different pay payment methods between the different types of THWs? I feel like I just okay. talked a lot, so I'll, I'll leave that up to my colleagues, but I'm happy to answer. Okay. I, I'd be happy to answer. Um, Iris in the chat did a great job of saying that the traditional health worker term is the umbrella term for the several types of providers. Um, <clears throat> underneath that includes the CHWs, doulas, peers. Um, and so THW is the overarching, and then we have different types down below. And, and then I yes, guess there are lots of different payment methods per worker type. It makes the work. Uh, excessively complicated sometimes, but it is true that uh, it's actually different by worker type. Great, thank you for that. Um, there was also a question about the payment codes for CHWs. Um, I saw one of you put the codes in the chat. Um, do you wanna repeat that or refer people to the chat? Well, the link is in the chat as well as the 3 initial codes that are part of that um, list were 989606162 and it um, outlines the amount of time spent as well as how many people are um, in front of you. Okay. Uh, next question is, can a CHW bill all Oregon health plan, um, I'm assuming uh, bill the Oregon health plan, or does it have to go through the CCO's contract? So I answered that one in the chat as well. And it, um, yeah, so being part of the fee schedule, it is a covered service. Um, I would just check with the CCO to make sure that there's no other requirements um, if you're out of network, but it, it's a reimbursement reimbursable service for um, OHP open card as well as the CCOs. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, both of you, I believe, mentioned uh, grants that are available through your CCOs uh, to support CHW services. How do folks apply for a grant uh, from their CCO? How do they uh, learn about the process? I know for for Pacific source, uh, as as my slide kind of denoted, there are several ways to engage in in funding from Pacific source. We have a foundation. Uh, we have specific uh, grant opportunities for our contracted providers. And then in each region, we have relationships with uh, something called a health council um, that has a lot of our community based initiatives and, and other kinds of. Um, funding that that folks would have opportunities to engage with uh, in each of those regions. So it's a little bit complicated with us, but uh, I, again, I encourage folks to check out the links. Okay. If Iris is, if it's complicated, ours is also complicated because um, the health councils, we have local community health partnerships. And um, the best way I would say is to be active in one of your local community health partnerships, health councils, CACs, uh, which are community um, advisory councils. That's where a lot of information is pushed from a community based organization perspective, but also the information is available online as I well as I assume as well with Iris. It's with the links. They're available online too. So. Okay, great. Um, and last question before we close out here. Um, are any demographics being prioritized to train and hire as CHWs? I can say for the EO CCO service area, um, the uh, Hispanic population or Latin, Latina, Latinx uh, is a priority because that's our prevalent language other than English in our service area, um, which is, I mean, I, I know I stated it in one of the, the slides, but we're working on a training program with, um, it's already launched with OSU, 
again, based on our partnership with them to certify um, OH, to be have to have OHA certified or qualified interpreters. Um, and it's a Spanish language specific, and we really are looking for CHWs to um, attend in that course. So we do have, we have prioritized. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we are out of time, unfortunately. I feel like we could have had a whole half a day session <laughs> dedicated to this, um, but really encourage you all to engage with your CCO around CHW payment. You look for the traditional health worker liaison at the CCO that covers your region, um, and they'll be able to help you out. Uh, feel free to reach out to um, me. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat in a moment, um, and I can help you find the person um, that you should uh, be talking to at your CCO um, if it's not Iris or Summer. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, again, a reminder, I put a link in the chat for our survey. Uh, you can apply for continuing education credits for this webinar. Um, and then our next population health webinar is June 22nd at noon, where we're going to be talking about building healthy uh, communities through, excuse me, through strategic partnerships. Um, and I will put the link again to register for that in the chat. But again, thank you so much for sharing such a wealth of information and Summer and Iris. We appreciate it so much as we all try to navigate this space um, and really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank all you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.